ask your indulgence, we had to do a little field expediency on the screen. Decided to walk away somewhere, so it wasn't to be found. And also, our amplifier uh, wants to amplify when it wants to, and not when they want to. So we have a couple of issues. It's working now. It's great. All right. Uh, our speaker today is Eric ba uh, Baser of uh, Photographics, located in Evanston, Illinois. He's the owner and the chief photographer. Is that right, Eric? Uh, chief photo retoucher, chief yeah. Chief photo retoucher. Uh, he's previously presented to our membership, and I'm sure all of you, or most of you, are familiar with him as, as, as I am. Uh, he's going to speak today about a subject called 50 Photoshop speech, Speed Techniques Using Adobe Photoshop Elements, 9 and newer. And so there should be a handout available for everybody. If you don't have one, there's a couple of up, several up here. Uh, and if we run out, uh, just email myself or Eric and we'll get you a, a copy. Uh, there is a table set up here for some very wonderful uh, items here for purchase. So after the uh, speech uh, presentation today, please avail yourself of anything uh, or consider purchasing anything that looks attractive to you. So Eric, it's all yours. All right, thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Couric, and to the board, the presidents, vice presidents, past presidents. Um, I think I've seen everybody cycle through at least once. Uh, so I've been blessed with the opportunity to be before this society for over 10 years, many times. I, I've lost count now. So um, I don't take this lightly. I, I really do appreciate the support of the society. When I'm done, uh, we're gonna really speed through this. I hope to be able to take questions, but this is gonna be a different type of workshop or lecture from what I usually do. And we're gonna really be moving fast. Uh, but when I'm done, I would like you to then ask your questions. Also, I am recording this, so if everything works out with the recording, the quality will not be great. It's because it's a camera right here with me and then there's this screen here. But at least you'll have an, some type of recording of the session. What I suggest you do is join the email newsletter. I have a, 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 um, a clipboard out there. And once a month I send out notices. And when I have this on our YouTube channel, you'll get an update about it. Uh, it might be a while, but I plan to do it. Also, this is specifically for a program called Adobe Photoshop Elements. Now before we go ahead, I would like to know what, you, what you're using to edit your pictures. So let me see a raise of hand of anyone who uses Adobe Photoshop Elements. All right, very good. And how many of you are using the higher end Adobe Photoshop, the real expensive one, the CS6, CS5? I have it, but I don't have All right. So what I'm showing here will also apply to that. Uh, some of the keyboard shortcuts I share will be different. I highly encourage you to contact me if there's any problems. This is the first time I'm presenting this specific lecture, so there's bound to be a few little bumps in the road here and there where you'll say, wait a minute, this isn't quite working. I think I fixed all the errors, but uh, there is a chance some slip through. So again, I consider you a student of mine. Stay in touch. Join the email newsletter and ask your questions. Feel free to email me at any time. I will not bill you for it at all. Ah, so first, number one is when I work on pictures, and I always recommend if you're going to spend an hour, two, three, or four on working on pictures on your computer, even if it's just a few hours a week, get one of these wonderful little tablets. It's called a Wacom tablet. It's uh, in the handout. There's different types. There's the Intuos, the Bamboo, but it's all by the same company, Wacom or Wacom. And it's a little pen, stylus like this, and you work here. It takes a little while to get used to, but when you are clicking and clicking with a mouse, you are gonna wear out your poor little tendons and muscles, and you'll end up with one evening, you'll wake up, ah, oh, you got this pain throughout your arm. 
this saved me. <laughs> I used to have lots of pain in my wrist and my arm. Not anymore. And it's even nice for using just for regular work. And it also comes with a mouse in case you like to use that. Buy a high quality scanner. Number two, buy a high quality scanner. And save your scanner. When I talk about a high quality scanner, I'm talking about something made by Epson. Everything new by Epson is just really great quality. Save your scans as TIFF files, not as JPEG. And uh, you will also try to get something that it will scan transparencies or slides also. And usually most of the Epson, uh, Epson brands have that. I don't have specific numbers to give you, uh, but whatever's out there is usually very affordable, $100, $200, $300 and up for, you know, more features. But generally you can get one for 100 bucks or 200 bucks. They're really, really good. When you're working on photos and fixing the color on them and uh, any kind of work on photos, close your window shades. Now window shades, what is that? That's some kind of program you're <laughs> talking about? No, no, I'm talking about those those, I you about that. Yeah, those real win exactly. That's why I'm bringing it up. I'm talking about those real windows with real window shades that have nothing to do with the computer. Why is that? You get sunlight coming through the windows, generally. Generally, sunlight is streaming into the windows. That can cut the visibility of your image on screen by up to 50%. And it can make working difficult. And you'll be squinting and getting close and getting a headache. Why, why isn't it printing what I see? And then I look at it, I email it, and it's totally blown out. Close the window shades. When it comes to a monitor, don't be cheap. HP and Samsung make some great computer monitors at good prices. What do you get? Uh, CRT? No, you don't need to get CRT anymore, the big cathode ray tubes. You can just get your regular flat screen, uh, LED, LCD. They're very good nowadays. All right. Flip the mattresses, change the smoke detector battery, and color calibrate the computer monitor. What am I talking about? Twice a year, we're encouraged to change that smoke detector or generally smoke detector battery and flip the mattresses so they wear out on the right end. Well, your monitor shifts in brightness and color over the months, over the years. It's a mechanical device nevertheless, an electronic and mechanical device that wears out. Every one of your computers has a little thing, a little a control panel for displays that will allow you to tweak the color a little bit. You want to do that twice a year. How many of you have Macintoshes? Yeah, so that, that is done. I'm sorry PC users, I can't help you on this, but I know it's there. You go to System Preferences and you click on, uh, what was it? Displays and Color. And then there's a button over here that says Calibrate. Click that and it takes you through the process step by step. Some monitors, especially for PC, have some really decent color cal uh, calibration uh, uh, software that you can install with the drivers. So uh, that, that can be very useful. But for Macintosh users, your system preferences, color calibration is sufficient. Save all your files, edited and unedited, in one folder on your computer. And then manage them with something in Photoshop Elements called Organizer. Over here is a button that says Organizer. And whenever you save a file in Elements, it even has a checkbox it says organize, include in the elements organizer. You should do that. If you have Adobe Bridge, Adobe Bridge is a great organizer. Why do I say that? I have a whole 
lecture on that specific topic, organizing your photos. <laughs> but I'll say this, with keywords, with metadata, you definitely want to keep everything in one spot and you want your file name to be respectable in that you have an idea of what the subject matter is about. When you have a picture open on screen, I'm going to go to this picture here. This is a subject, this is something you learn in photography class or art class. That is, you look at a picture to assess it. What is important on it? Generally, you want to examine a picture a little closer and squint when you look at it. And when you squint, you'll see generally what the camera and anyone else would see. And that is real blotchy dark areas. There's detail, there's information in there. So if you happen to start color correcting the picture, uh, Phew. <laughs> if you happen to start color correcting the picture, uh, you won't l be so quick to lose those kind of details. If you're going to increase the contrast or the brightness or the darkness, you want it a little darker. You want to be able to just look at the picture and assess it, get a good idea of what's there, understand the picture. This is just a little tip to make your work a little easier. Now, in now we're going right into Photoshop Elements, the technical aspect. One thing I really love about Photoshop Elements is the help interface. All right? It's not just a book, it's not just a help menu, it's actually very interactive. And over here on the right side, you see something called the edit panel. And under, under the word edit is, uh, I hope you can see a little bit, yeah quick and guided. When you click guided, anything you want to do, or you want to understand, it will tell you how to do it step by step. You say, I want to crop this photo. Well, you click crop photo. It sets the crop box for you. It tells you crop box has been drawn on your photo using the crop tool. And then it tells you exactly what to do, right? And you can move your slides over. You can even restrict it to a certain uh, dimension if you'd like um, and down here is a neat little green or red green means go ahead and crop red means don't crop it's just really really nice anything you want so I, I, I when, when you're done uh, with it you just click done and then you can do some other activity light I want to lighten or darken my image I want to adjust levels I want to enhance colors uh, I have a group shot. All kinds of things. It's just really helpful. So, so it's something to play around with when you get a chance. Now, undo history. Has anyone ever messed around with the undo history? Like you may you did some work, you're like, ooh, I want to undo. Well, that is limited to 50 states in Photoshop Elements. So you can only go back 50 steps in your undo history in Photoshop Elements by default. You can change that. You can change that. So go to Photoshop Elements, Preferences. Oh, now, now it's working. All right. There we go. All right. So, uh, Preferences. I don't know. Maybe turn the gain down a little bit. Yeah, that, that's better. Go to Preferences and Performance. <laughs> All right. And over here on the right side is a box that says History States. Look at that. You can crank it all the way up to 1,000. Now, only problem with cranking it up that far is every state of history uses up RAM, random access memory in your computer. So the more states you accumulate, the slower the machine, will, your computer will get the slower Photoshop will perform, perform. So 50 to me is a sufficient amount, but for some reason, you don't think so? Well, now you know how to change it. All right. Now, part of workflow, part of workflow 
is uh, <laughs> part a neat uh, part of workflow is knowing where you're working, and 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 sometimes when you zoom in close and you're cleaning up spots. Let me, for example, I'll I'll open up uh, uh, one of these pictures here. So you're cleaning up um, dust spots or something. It can get quite tedious. All right. So what I use, I use what's called a grid, and I'll show you how to do that. You want to first go to your preferences. And this grid does not embed itself into the picture. It's, it's just really amazing. Go to preferences, guides and grid, and this is in the handout. And then over here, it says grid line, make it one inch and make your subdivision one. And then choose a color like a red. So I just click on this little color thing and I just move my little slide around to find a color I like. I like to go with red. It's a little more visible. And click OK. Now I want to make it display. I want to show this grid. I go to view grid. You see? So now as I'm working, I say I want to work in, I'm going to st always start in a methodical fashion. So I'm cleaning up this spot, I'm cleaning up that spot. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not actually doing it now for you, but I'm showing you as if I was doing it. And see how you can move along and see how neat that is? As opposed to like, I'll go over here and I'll go over here. And you always miss something. This way you work in little quadrants, little areas, and you, you, you get it done right. Get it done. It's one room at a time. You know, you clean the house one room at a time. <laughs> Don't run the basement, clean up the desk, and go to your bedroom and dust. It's a waste of time. <clears throat> Do one at a time. Keep in mind um, your resolution. The grid size may appear to change based on your resolution. So if, if my image had was 72 pixels per inch or 300 pixels per inch, actually the way the grid is displayed may change a little bit. So you might have to go back into preferences and change it instead of one inches, you might make, make it two inches or make it half an inch or quarter of an inch or whatever. Play around with it. Now while you're working, sometimes you'll get to a spot where you say, I've had enough, but I'm not done. Well, so you get a little anxious and because you're aware when I get back on this picture, how do I know where I left off? You know, because this is just a lot of, lot of work I'm doing. You want to use guides. I'll show you how to do that. The first way to do that is to show your rulers. And it's it's pretty neat function. So you go to view and show, I mean, sh let me get another picture up. For some reason it's not showing there on that one. Yeah. So, uh, give me one second. That's not, I think it's because I'm in guided. So, look at your, uh, if, if you're ever stuck, you're like, wait, Eric, some, some tip isn't working. Go to full, edit full. We're gonna, that's much better. Now we go to view, rulers. And you notice at the left side and at the top, we've got some rulers. So I'm working on, we said, this one. And now, uh, let me just ignore this right here. I'm just, I want to make this just a little, so you guys, so you all don't uh, get sore necks. Um, so here I'm working, and I show my rulers. And I say, okay, I'm stopping here because I need a break. And all you do is click and drag from the ruler pulling these guides. And there's where I left off. You follow me? You see how? So right there I say, okay, right there, X marks the spot. That's where I left off. So I know tomorrow morning when I come back to work all cheerful and recharged, I know where to pick up from. Now, it's nice that I have these guides, but I do want to get rid of them because I'm going to keep working on it, right? So all you do is Choose the move tool up here in your toolbar. And then put your tool right on the line and you'll see it changes, the cursor changes to this little, looks like a little spaceship there. 
a little UFO from some sci-fi in the 1950s. And then we'll drag it into the rulers. And because you dragged it into the rulers, it put the guides away. Another, another way you can you know, work with that is if you have your guides, you can actually leave them there where you want. And you can simply, uh, you can simply hide them. Right? So all you do is just go to view rulers and uncheck it. I'm sorry, rulers. <laughs> guides and uncheck it. So you've made it appear and reappear. And that's toggling the rulers off and on. And of course, there's a neat little shortcut, Control shift r or Command shift r Experiment with that on your own. Ah, great question. So those lines, those grids, those blue lines, when I print this picture or I save it and share it with someone, will they still show up? No. However, if they open it in Photoshop Elements, they might see the guides there. So it might be a good protocol just to remove the guides out of it. Don't hide them because they may have guides on for some other last time they used it. It could be a little, oh, what's this? You know, great question. And the guides also have their own keyboard shortcut that you can do uh, uh, control on the PC or command on the Mac and the uh, quote key. See, I'm turning them off and on. It's kind of cool to do. And the grids have the, uh, let's see, the grid, the, uh, the grids off and on. Play with it on your own, <laughs> but they work. Play with the sh keyboard shortcuts in there. I'm not big on teaching keyboard shortcuts because it, I, it just seems to, I seem to, people seem to space out with it and I just don't want to do that. I just want to make it fun. Now here's something I included that's not in Elements, but it is in Photoshop, the expensive one. It's called full screen mode. You, you press the F key. Try it. It's it's pretty neat. It, it blanks out all the tablet, all the all the uh, palettes and the toolbars, and just lets you see the image. It's a great way to just look at the image without the clutter. Another great tool that you should experiment with is the hand tool. So up here in the toolbar is a hand. Click it. There's a hand tool. And it, it only works, it doesn't do anything if you're zoomed out completely. But when you're zooming in and you're examining a picture, you click and drag and it moves it along. So, see what I'm doing? That's with the hand tool. It comes, in, it's very handy. The hand tool's handy, get it? Eh, all right. Okay, enough comedy. Show us some more. All right, all right. Number 18. All right. Now, let's say, let's go back to, let's go back to this one, because this one is not, this picture up here is not so overwhelming to people. All right, so here I am. I got the hand tool. I'm in close. How can I zoom? How can I go to the zoom tool? How can I go to the clone stamp tool and use the hand tool? Well, let's say I'm using the clone stamp tool. And I, I am, I get rid of these, I'm getting rid of these spots, but I want to keep moving. So I option click, getting rid of it. But I want to move on. Hold the space bar down and move. And then you got your clone stamp tool back. So this is a nice quick switch between the hand tool and any other tool you're using. So see, I still got the clone stamp tool chosen over here, but when I hit the space bar, it temporarily shifts to the hand tool. This will save you a lot of time too. Now let's say I have the zoom tool. Let's say while I'm working, I want to zoom in and out while I'm using the clone stamp tool, for example. So I use it sometimes. You hold down the space bar and the control key or the command key on your Mac, and this is on the keyboard. Uh, I'm sorry, this is on the handout. And you click. 
let go. Now I hold down my space bar, my command key, click. And then when I let go of my command key, I got my hand tool. So it's a kind of neat thing. If I hold down the option or the alt key and the command key and the space bar, I can zoom out and move. I've just let go of keys. So what happens is you end up, anyone here play piano? Or, yeah, yeah, she plays piano. I think there used to be a piano down here, right? No? Okay, I'm, I'm mixing places up. But anyways, uh, it's very much like that. And it, or, or more like strings, maybe. Maybe on an organ, too, or a piano, those, those uh, pedals, what are they called? Well, anyways, play around with it. See, see what you can come up with. It's toggling between the zoom tool and other tools. Now, here's a great thing. I do a whole workshop on this topic. And it's called Keywords. So this only works for one picture at a time. So let's say this picture. We know what this picture is. So we said, here's uh, Frank G. Anderson and his Salvation Army troop on the south side at blah, blah, blah. So in 19, whatever, whatever. So I would go to File, File, Info. And here I could type in the description of the photo, who, what, when, why, when, where. And in this field called keywords down here, I would type in the keyword. So we said Frank Anderson, so I'll do Frank Anderson, comma. It said Salvation Army, right? Salvation Army. Then I do the year. What year? You don't remember. Let's say 1929. We'll say Chicago, Illinois, spell it out and do the abbreviation of Illinois, USA, United States, and, and whatever else keywords that are specific. Don't put man, don't put leaf, <laughs> unless that's the subject matter. You know, keep it precise to what the picture is about. And when you do that, when you do that, you, you embed and click OK. You embed that data into the image. They call it metadata. And we heard that in the news about the, you know, the government snooping and metadata is going to get you. But see, metadata actually is, is a very important part of archiving. So, so all the li any librarians here, any archivists, historians, you know, uh, people, who work at, people who are working with archives, they're all dealing with metadata. And another neat thing about it is your, your computer will be able to search it. So that's why I say put all your pictures into one folder, and you know what you're looking for. You're, 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 you're thinking Salvation Army. So this is my search uh, window, okay? And they're, they're, now it's giving me results for Salvation Army, and, and lo and behold, there is the Salvation Army uh, picture that I just keyworded, all right? And the file name doesn't even have to say Salvation Army. <clears throat> Maybe I just want pictures of the Salvation Army to give the people in the Salvation Army. Uh, it's a great way to find those pictures. Again, that's a whole nother workshop. I went over time on that one tip. <laughs> All right. Now, we're, again, we're talking about workflow. So we really, sometimes we need more space to examine the picture. Hit the tab key on your keyboard, and it hides all the palettes. And toolbar, look at that. So after, before. And let me get rid of these uh, rulers too. Pretty cool. Just quick, quick little, quick little uh, tip for you there. Now over here on the palette bin, that's over here on the right side. This is called the this is called the palette bin over here. All these palettes in here. So, so maybe you wanna you wanna take a palette out of there because Elements by default locks it into a, a bin. So use it. You could just drag it right out. So here's my layers palette. Here's my effects palette, which is useless for pictures like this. Um, so I can close it. Uh, info. Okay, so I can drag that out, put it over there. This is kind of neat if you got two monitors, you got real big monitor, you want to put your palettes on one side and your picture on the other. If you really want to go, you know, super pro retoucher uh, on your pictures, you can do that. And then if you want to put them back in, you just drag it back into the palette bin and it gives you a little blue highlight. You just drop it in there. 
See, it gives you a little blue highlight there. See it? Kind of, you, you drop it. There, there they are. They're all in there. Now, the, the panel bin uh, can actually be hidden as well. So we go to window and uncheck panel bin. Boom. It's gone. Got more space instantly. And I can go back to it to make it show up. Application frame. And this is, again, another thing to give you more room. Watch this. Go to window and application frame. And it basically gets rid of that big gray area that was behind. You know how, see, Elements kind of gives you a big gray frame behind the pictures. But maybe you want to see the desktop behind there because you've got some little folder on there, you see? So see, I can see my gray desktop. And if I hide my tools there uh, with the tab key, I just, hide, I just hit all my pellets with the tab key. Now I can see my desktop. So, you know, in case I got to drag something over or, or, or drag something to the trash, whatever I got to do. Now I go back to Window, and we go Application Frame. And once again, when I hit, <coughs> see, you can't see the desktop. So yeah, for me, I, like, I don't like to have that, that frame there, but it all depends on you know, your preferences. Now, when you're working with layers, uh, uh, and that's, again, that's another workshop, <laughs> but when you're working with layers, you get this little tiny thumbnail by default. It's real small. I like it to be bigger. I like to see a little bit more. And I don't do a, use a whole lot of layers anyways. So let me just maybe duplicate a, a layer here just so you can see we got a bunch of layers here, right? Now, I can go click on this little triangle here in the top right corner of the layer palette. And we go to what's called panel options. And this is number 26, by the way. And you can choose a size. All right, I better drink this water, as I will have to speak a little louder. And watch, I click the big size, right? I hit OK. Boom, look how big they are. Over here on the right, much bigger. I like that. That's a little too big, but for demonstration purposes. Now, a keyboard shortcut that everybody got to know is the zoom tool. Z, 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 zebra, zero. Hit the Z key on your keyboard, instantly you'll have the zoom tool. Just wanted to share, share that with you. Very valuable. Now, if you have one of these, it comes with a mouse. Like, I like my mouse. Some people like their mouse. You know, they don't want to get rid of their mouse, maybe to use a pen a little bit. So what you do, you could actually zoom in and out with the mouse wheel. So you hold the op Alt Option key on the keyboard. This is with any tool. You could have the clone stamp tool going, whatever tool, it doesn't matter. But hold the Option key down and scroll with the mouse. And I'm scrolling with the mouse. I can't really show you right. I'm just doing this. See? That's pretty neat. That could save you some time. Now, let's go to our Salvation Army picture again. And we are like, we're working with, oh, this is, this is good, this is good. But how do I see it at 100% size? How do I see it at the size that other people will see it, whether they print it or look at it on screen? Simply double click the zoom tool in the toolbar up here and watch what happens to the picture. It goes to 100%. Right there. That's 100% size. That's the exact size of this particular image. And this is, this is how it's going to look on screen. So if you email this to someone, that's how big it's going to be when they, they look at it in their email. So you, you bring the size down a little bit. Image size. That's a whole nother, that's a whole nother workshop there. When you go to my YouTube channel, I got lots of videos for you. Lots of videos all about image size and file format and layers and, and uh, gardening. No, just kidding. Uh, now, here's something pretty neat. This is only available in Elements. But I don't know, maybe Photoshop, see, the Creative Cloud is doing it. 
I'm boycotting Adobe because they're renting their software now. I refuse to rent software. Like, I just refuse. But um, here, a great way to save time is, you know, you, when you scan, I don't know if you all done this, but you can put multiple pictures on the flatbed. When you scan them all, let's say you choose to scan them all as one image. <coughs> With Epson's driver, you don't have to do it that way, but that's another workshop. But I want to show you, just in case this is the way you want to do it, how you can have, have it divided. So look at this. Image, and then go to Divide Scanned Photos. Click that, and then it does its, this is my magic. I'm, And now look at that, it, it has taken each one and, and given me three different files. And they're pretty nice, neatly cropped. Did you see that? I did that without touching the keyboard. Come on now, come on, come on. Come on. Hey. No, 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 you gotta, you gotta say Photoshop. You gotta say, okay, Adobe, good job, good job. All right, uh, you gotta be nice to Adobe for that. So I thought that was neat. All right, so wh what happens, okay, Eric, that's nice. But here's something we all run into, right? I'm gonna show you, let me close this. All right, so we got, how many of y'all got an oversized picture, right? It's so big, this is all you can fit on the scanner, right? It's like, well, okay, I can only fit that part, I can only fit that part, I can only fit that part, one at a time, right? So you ended up with like four scans of a giant 16 by 20 beautiful portrait of some ancestors. And how do I put this together? Well, there's lots of ways to do it. I could do it manually. But sometimes you have what's called photo merge. And how many of y'all have a flip pal scanner? No? Okay. Right, we'll talk about flip pal another day. But uh, flip pal has the same type of software built in it. It's a little buggy sometimes, but it's very nice. It's actually a little bit better than uh, Adobe's. But anyways. Let's put this one to work. We want Photoshop to automatically put all four of these pictures together as one. So we go to File and uh, New, Photo Merge, and we got to choose one of these photo merges. There's a whole family of photo merges. My favorite photo merge child is Panorama. She's very well behaved. All right. And then what you do, you, you got to add all those pieces. So we, go to, we can go to Browse, and I can, I can, I can click and add, Shift-click. Okay, Oversize. There's my oversizes, right? I've added them all, and I click OK. And Photoshop Elements goes through here. Abracadabra, Abracadu, Ooga Booga, Slanty Slant, Rotate Shift. Layer selection and ah, there we go. Now look at that, and it says, "Would you like it to automatically fill the edges of your panorama?" So what that means is it'll go fill it with green or black or whatever color. I don't like it to do that, but let's see what happens. And it gives me a nice. It's going to probably put a white fill in the background. Now, depending on how much RAM you have on your computer. It, it could be a lot faster than what mine is doing, or slower. Uh, I always recommend, you know, max out the RAM on your computer, get a gigabyte at least, um, so that your system can run and all that stuff. You know we all like to have our little Facebook page going at the same time while we're working. So it didn't look so pretty, because what it did is it, it took some, uh, and copied some of the bad areas over here. So I'll have to redo that one, but not today. But pretty neat, huh? So that was tip number uh, 31. All right, and we're, we're, we're halfway done and running out of time. So I'll, 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 these are kind of quick. So we get the crop tool. This is, not, this is in the full, not the guided palette. We're, we're working in full mode still. But over here is the crop tool in your tool, toolbox. And I can, you can actually set it to crop at a specific dimension. So let's go back to Salvation Army and uh, double click it in that bin there. 
I zoom out and I want it to be I want to crop this to be a 5 by 7 so I choose up here let me make sure you guys can, you all can see this right it's called the aspect ratio and I want a 5 by 7 I just click drag and stretch it out and it gives me a 5 by 7 so when it crops it it's going to be a 5 by 7 uh, image what makes a good scan what is a selection what are layers what is resolution what is a JPEG what is TIFF what is RGB how do I crop a picture what is a zoom tool what is a clone stamp what are levels my name is Eric Basir and I have produced this unique photo restoration and retouching foundations video course to answer all these questions and more in my classes and workshops I have taught hundreds how to preserve and restore their personal photographic collections with Adobe Photoshop and Adobe Photoshop Elements. Now you can have me as your personal instructor in this 10 lesson course. After studying the videos and easy to read workbook, you'll finish with a firm foundation of how to use Adobe Photoshop or any other photo editing program confidently and correctly. Right? There it is at 100%. And that's tip number 32. It's kind of neat. And the, uh, the other way you can do it is, I actually did these in reverse, sorry. You can actually set it. So let's say you want an odd size. You're like, I want a 3 by 6. So you actually go up here and you enter it, three by six. So you want the width to be six, for example, and you wanted your height to be three. Watch, watch this. Because you know you're gonna crop it funny, but that's because you, you're gonna use it in a promotional thing or whatever, and, or you just want these particular people showing up. There's a neat way to do it. So you know your crop is gonna be a, an exact, a specific size. Now, cropping is nice, but I like to call it, when I teach, I call it the careful tool. Crop carefully. <laughs> so uh, the reason being is you might think that, uh, and by the way, if you want to get rid of uh, these aspect ratios, you actually have to turn them off. So one way to do that is to actually delete what you put, enter into these boxes. Or let me move over here go up and say no restriction. So be careful because you're like, oh, Eric showed me this tip. Now I have to crop everything at three, three by six inches. That's, you got to get rid of that, that thing there. Um, so you want to be careful when you crop because, I mean, you may say, okay, this is all I need. But, you know, this ivy, you know, maybe there's no more ivy on that church anymore. You know, whatever. Everything has its right to be in your image. Uh, uh, so as, as a historian, as a genealogist, as someone who's respectful of history, I suggest leaving things, no matter how extraneous they may seem, telephone pole coming out of the head, leave it. And then the one you want to get rid of, you save a copy and, and make your copy the one that you got rid of the telephone pole or the plant or the dog head coming out of their neck, you know. That's just a little important tip. Nothing technical. All right, so here we got, here we got a uh, bunch of images. I got a bunch of windows, right? I'm gonna show you. I got, I'm, I'm, I'm working on all these pictures. Oh my goodness. This is a mess. I wanna see everything neatly. I wanna see everything in a organized fashion. So I wanna see one, two, three, four, five, all in a row. So what we do is up here in the menu bar, it's kind of tricky, but it's a button actually. And it's called Arrange Documents. It's a button way up at the top. You click that, and let me, let me get in a little closer for you all, like, like this. Right. So then I click, let me click that, and it's gonna tile all in grid, tile all vertically, tile all horizontal. I can tile, tile whatever way I wanna tile. So I click that, and zoom out. Look at that, isn't that neat? put everything in a, a neat manner. And there's other keyboard shortcuts you can do to make them all sized to the right 
right uh, to make it fit the window. You have to find that one out on your own. Now, okay, I got a whole bunch of windows open. It's time to close them all. But I don't want to close each one and save it on my own individually. Real simple. Go to File, Close All. And that has a keyboard shortcut in there as well. Close All. It says Save Changes. And let's just pretend I wanted to save some or not save all. I'm not going to save any just for demonstration purposes, just because I don't want to save all the goofy stuff I just did. So it's, it's coming up. And boom, they're all clear. They're all clear. All right, how much time we got? Enough for the 50 tips. Yeah, just keep going. <laughs> keep going, good, thank you. All right. Now, if sometimes, uh, uh, you know, you know, you, Eric says save as uh, TIFF, not as JPEGs. Ah, oh, Eric, I just worked on a whole bunch of pictures and saved them as JPEG. No problem. So in Photoshop Elements, you go to File, Process Multiple Files, and you go and find a folder of images. So let's say I choose this. And this will take a long time to do, so we're not going to actually go through with the process, but I wanted to show you. Then you make a destination folder. So a folder that's maybe on your desktop or something. And let me do that. And then down here, it says file type. So click convert files to. Tiff. Boom, right there. And then you click OK. Also, you can have it rename the file. You can have it rename the files. Play, play around with it. Play around with it. I'm not going to show you everything on here, but I want you to try it out when, when, you, when, you, get, when you get home. And maybe you accidentally, you, maybe you want to just change file names. Maybe you don't like your file untitled 1, untitled 2, untitled 3. <laughs> you want something to make a little more sense. You know, you go that way and you do it. Now, before you work on a picture, before you start working on a picture, and, and this is a very valuable uh, 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 tip, uh, no matter what you do, um, actually, I don't want that picture. Let's do, uh, let's do this picture. This one's a better one. You, you, you should duplicate the background layer. So that, I showed you earlier that you just drag it into this new page icon or go to layer. Duplicate layer. Hit OK. Now, Elements has these great auto color correcting. I'm going to show you one of them. But notice I duplicated the background layer first. So all we do is we go to Menu, Enhance, and then choose one of these. Auto Contrast, Auto Levels, Adjust Lighting. Adjust Lighting is not auto. Let's do Auto Levels. That means levels of color. That's all it means. Ooh, that's pretty. And the neat thing about now having it in layers is when I turn off the layer by clicking this eyeball right here, I can see what it used to look like underneath. All right, and I say, oh, that's too much. And I can drop the opacity of it. So it's just a little more darker, but not completely. This is a neat little thing to play around with. I don't suggest color correcting pictures like this. I don't teach it this way, but it's good to know. Sometimes you just need to make a quick adjustment and send it off to so-and-so because you know you just want them to be able to see the picture but you're not going to spend a whole lot of time working on the picture all right how many of y'all ever uh, type type on your pictures you know put a little text a little description yeah maybe you know so-and-so this is this is you know judy this is nabila this is you know marilyn whatever it's, you know james okay so we're going to do that real quick by choosing the type tool over here. And we have to get a color for the text. Since this is a grayscale image, it's not going to be so effective. So let me close that one. Let's just do it on this one. We got to click this little box up here and change it to a color that can be seen. So I click. And I'm going to start typing, you know. We'll say Aunt Auntie Sheena. All right, whatever. He's coming up with names of relatives. 
<laughs> and I want to make it nice and big. I do it that way. But what if I don't like the font? I want to change the font, but I don't want to go through a list of 100 fonts. I want to see what it looks like. All you do is click the font name up here. You can see that. Yeah, it says Myriad Pro. And then the arrow keys on my keyboard, up and down, I go and I go through them like this. So say, oh, I like that font. I like that font. I like that font. I like that font. Like, so eventually you got to decide which one to do. But you know, you like that font. Nice. Looks like you know late 1800s kind of font. Matches the picture. I thought that was kind of neat. And uh, let me get back on my screen here. Clone stamp tool. I want to use the clone stamp tool real quick. All you do is hit the S key on your keyboard. Boom. And it just selected the clone stamp tool. Now be careful because it could also be the pattern stamp tool, which is a real pain. <laughs> All right, so you might have to hit S a couple times. You know, so S, 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 S. My son likes to say S a lot now. He's saying S. All right. Healing brush. How many of y'all ever used a healing brush? Well, that's a neat little tool. You, you haven't played around with it yet. Um, it's similar to the clone stamp tool. Keyboard shortcut for that is J. And when you cycle through it, it takes you to the spot healing brush. Play with them when you get home. Try them out. The, uh, show you real quick the uh, multi-picture scan. I zoom in here. So my healing brush is down here in the tool, tool, uh, toolbox, and that's called spot healing brush. A spot healing brush is kind of cool. So all you do is just click on it, and it does a little computer estimate of what it could be. And sometimes you'll use this a lot more than the clone stamp tool. But you got to be careful because sometimes if things are along the edge, it doesn't handle it right. So you might have to undo and try again. That's the spot healing brush. And then the healing brush acts just like the clone stamp, where you actually have to do an alt option click to get a sample and then click again. So the healing tool takes its own sample without me sampling? Spot healing tool. Yeah, it takes yes. Its own sample. Yeah, okay. it does. And sometimes it works, and like I said, sometimes it doesn't. Okay. So you, what you do is you undo and you try again. Because it works randomly. It's, it's really interesting. It's got a mind of its own. Uh, ah. All right, so here's a neat tool, quick selection. And, oh, did I, workshop scans, oh my, I didn't prepare that one. Oh, I had a beautiful picture of a, uh, a church where the gravestones that the, um, they were photographing were blown out and I didn't, oh. All right, well, I'm gonna have to use this one. All right, so let's say this guy is not what I like. I, it's, it's too blown out, or the people, I need to brighten the people, and, but the sky is fine. How do I select the sky real quick? There's a tool over here, and let me get in close, right? It's called Quick Selection Tool. And it, it's, it's a quick selection tool for sure. And you just select, and what it does is it builds a selection around, yeah, this is not a good example because it doesn't have strong contrast. So let's just try to select the people. It's a neat way to select just the people if you have to just work on them. This is really crude, what I'm about to do, but this is just to demonstrate. See how I've adjusted them? Separate from everything else, all right? Yeah, you have to go in and feather it or refine edge right here. There's a button right here. Make sure you do this refine edge because you know your edge might be a little too harsh. This will actually feather or smooth out the edge of your selection. Again, this is a that's that's part of a different lecture where I where we take our time with it. <coughs> Number 44 is <clears throat> a very important step and sometimes we get carried away, is the sharpening, sharpening, uh, sharpening your images. All right, you should sharpen your images, in my opinion, at the end of the process. <clears throat> so I open this, 
And I'm all done working on it. All the spots are gone. The color's back, you know, even though it's really not. We duplicate our background layer. Go to layer, duplicate. And we're going to sharpen now. And the way you sharpen is you go to sh filter, sh uh, sharpen. You know what? I'm so used to Photoshop. I, I got to look at my... Ah. <laughs> Sorry. The big Photoshop has it under filter. Elements has it under enhance. Enhance and unsharp mask. Very important. Not adjust sharpness. Unsharp mask. And you keep your radius down to around one, this slider here. Radius, I give you some tips of how to understand radius, how to measure it. And radius should be the sum of your image resolution divided by two. <laughs> what you talking about, Eric? I thought you didn't like math. Well, sometimes I like it. So how do we know our image size? How do we know our resolution? So we go to image, image resize, image size, and it tells us right down here, 150. Or, in elements, you could just look down here at the bottom and it tells you 150. So, what's 150 divided by uh, 2? It's uh, 75, right? Uh, okay. So, 150, what is my, my, I said, divided by 2 and then move the decimal place over. So, you end up with 0.75. So, that's 1. So, a good starting point for radius is 1 in an image like this. And then you adjust the mount just to get enough sharpening. And if for this particular image, it doesn't need a lot of sharpening. It's very subtle. Here's very extreme before, after. Here's very subtle. I always like to go for subtle. <clears throat> it's a good tip for you. That will take a, a lot of experimentation at home. You have to do that. And it's fun, actually. Just make sure you work in layers like I'm doing. And uh, another good tip is make sure you're at 100% view when, when you're, you're viewing at 100%, so double click that zoom tool before you do the unsharp mask. I was zoomed in too close. Make sure you're in at 100%. I guarantee if you do it that way, your sharpening won't be too much or too little. It'll be just right. Ah. So if, what happens if I have a, cro uh, a crooked scan? So I'm gonna I'm gonna sabotage one of my pictures here. And give me a second. Don't uh, try to follow what I'm doing here. Yeah. <laughs> and hey, that's okay. Don't you feel bad? So you got to choose what's called the straighten tool. Straighten tool, or click the P key on your keyboard. It's right down here. Straighten tool. Just use that. Uh, let me drag. Let me get. Let me just actually zoom in my screen. So, see this plus? And drag to the other plus. Make it. Tell them that's my straight line. Look at that straighten it out. You see that? It's pretty cool. Straighten tool. That rhymed. Ah, here's a fun one. So, I have a workshop where I talk about how to make, um, how to work with oversized images. So I say you can scan them, or you can do a copy shot. You have a good digital camera, you make a copy shot. You can do that too. And sometimes when you scan a picture, it's so old, the silver is coming out of the emulsion and it reflects. So when you scan it, it's got a weird sheen to it. So you got to do a copy shot. Or the picture's on a wall or people who ha own it say, no, you can't scan it. <clears throat> you know, we're a very important museum and who cares about your family and your genealogy? Take a picture of it. You're not going to scan it. All right, fine. Don't argue with it. So you take a picture of it. Um, 
So what, what, so when you do a copy shot, you ever notice how the picture kind of folds? It's like bent, it's distorted, right? It's got a weird distortion. I have a nice example here. Thank God for the Salvation Army, right? They have great sample pictures for us. See the bend over here on the right side? And on the left side, see how it's bending? The photo's bent. You see all this, this weird stuff on there? That's because it's bent. Okay, well, Eric, I don't want that bending. I gotta fix the distortion. How do I do that? <clears throat> so what we do is we go to filter. We go correct camera distortion. This is so neat. All right. And there's this little slider here called remove distortion. And you just move the slider to the right or to the left to adjust. And you pay attention to the grid. And you align it right along with the grid. Boom. Now watch this. I'm going to hit OK. And I'm going to do before and after. Before and see? You see the difference? Mm -hmm. Undo. That's how it used to be. This is how it is now. Look at that. Pretty neat. I mean, it's, it's, it's just fantastic. It's just it's a great little tool. All right, so red, red eye, red eye. Y'all like red eye, right? Like, yeah, I like red eye, yeah. I'm, I'm just trying to keep it fun while I'm over time and y'all are hungry. Want to get home. Can't just eat all these cookies and get your nutrition. Right? Although they taste good. So I, I like to do it manually. I don't know. These red eye tools, um, I'm not satisfied with them. So what I do is I grab the lasso tool up here and I, I click and hold it. Because there's actually a couple different lasso tools. I choose lasso tool. And all I do is, is click and drag along here. Now to make another selection around the other one, I actually had to hold the shift key down. And I make another one. I don't think I put that in there about the shift key. So you got to do a shift key for the other eye. All right. Then what I do is I go to enhance and I go to adjust lighting and uh, adjust hue and saturation. Mm hmm. Eric, wait a minute. Adjust lighting. I think I, I think I have a mistake here that I did not create. Enhance, adjust lighting, adjust hue and saturation. No, it's not here. It's adjust color. Ah, mistake. <laughs> okay, everybody, get your red pens. Get your red pens. Number 48, letter C. It's not enhance adjust lighting, it's enhance adjust color. All right, I, my apologies. By the way, if something doesn't work on this, please email me and say something so I can fix it and send you a correct one. Thank you. Adjust human saturation. I drag the saturation slider to the left. I got rid of the color, but they still look, whoa, like ghosts, you know? Looks like Gary Mitchell from Star Trek, uh, where man, no man has gone before. I don't know if y'all saw that. All right, anyways. And then you drag the lightness, and you can get your pupil back. Now, it's kind of rough, so we'll have to, we'll have to refine the edge. So, I, you know, what I do is let's undo what we did. And we'll refine the edge. We'll click this button, refine the edge, refine the edge. And what we'll do is give it a little one pixel feather and hit OK. And then we'll do that adjust color hue saturation again. There. Looks a little better. There. Much more, much more realistic. It's very crude the way I did it, but hey, I got I got rid of it. Um, this is something too you gotta play with, you know. <clears throat> and there's little filters to do that, but I, I just never, it's, it, it's never, it's, it's inco too inconsistent for me. All right, so I have a photo that is color. And I say, I like to make it black and white. Or I like to give it a sepia tone. So we get this all the time. And you might want to do it too. No, not that one. Salvation Army is not going to be able to help us with this one. Let me just crop this real quick here. Don't worry about it. Just ignore what I did. Okay. All right, good. So I have our color picture here. All I do is hold down a keyboard shortcut. 
Control Shift U on a PC or Command Shift U on a Mac. And it just turned into a black and white. Now the other way to do it is the way we worked on our uh, eye, our red eye. We go to Enhance, Adjust Color, Adjust Hue and Saturation. Same thing. All right. Now to make a sepia tone, we do the same process with a color picture. Got to have it. It's got to be in color. So if it's a grayscale picture like this, or this is actually a color picture of a grayscale, it's okay. So let's use this one. But if it's a grayscale picture, or you're like, I can't adjust color, why can't I adjust color? It's because it's a grayscale image. So you gotta go to image mode, RGB color. Because otherwise, if it's grayscale, like it is now, I just changed, I just made this grayscale. Watch what happens, enhance, adjust color. I can't choose. Adjust use that. It won't let me do it. So let me undo that. So let's go to image. Uh, sorry, enhance. Adjust color. Adjust hue and saturation. And I drag that all the way to the left. All right. And I can go into. Wait a minute. Oh, jeez, I'm doing it different. Sorry. I'm trying to make it so easy, and I keep thinking the way I think, and the way I think isn't always easy. I should follow what I put here. All right, here we go. Let's start all over. I'm going to follow, instead of trying to go like me, Mr. Smarty Pants, I don't need to look at my handout that I gave you. I'm going to follow my handout. <laughs> Sorry. So we're in color. We're in color. Sorry about that. Menu, enhance, all right? Then we go to adjust color, and then we do variations, color variations. This is so much faster. And then we decrease the blue once. See, there's a button that says decrease blue down here. We click that once. And then we click increase red. There's an increase red button over here. And we click that once. And then we hit OK. Sepia tone. Say, Eric, what were you trying to show me before, though? Don't worry about it. <laughs> do it this way. And like I said, if you do everything in layers, if we did that in a layer, so let's repeat that process. Watch this. I just This is not on here, so this is the last tip, so why not give you something a little to play with. So we, we, we decrease blue, we increase red. Does that work with color and black and white, or only black and white to start? It works with black and white, but it has to be in color mode. You follow me? Your black and white has to be scanned as color or converted to color. Got it? Got it? Got it? Yeah. In, 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 in real strict photo retoucher lingo, we wouldn't say it's black and white. We would say it's grayscale. And we know we can't work with it. All right, so anyway, so I just did this. So what I do is I go over to the layer palette and I adjust, adjust opacity. And then what I've done is I can, see, watch what happens, see? I can make just, that's too much sepia for my taste, so I can just cut it back a little bit. That's just enough for me, see? All right, so we're done. <clears throat> it was like 65 minutes. Thank you. Uh, questions? Questions, please. I got a question. Uh, I just want to see if there's any ladies first. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Hey, I'm moderating, so I'm letting you. Go right ahead. <laughs> I have um, uh, two questions. One is, on the Epson scanner that you said, mm -hmm. is the best one to get. So what makes a good scanner? What makes a bad scanner? What makes a good scanner? What makes a bad scanner? Um, generally, the, specifically the optics, the bulb, the light bulb, and the way it transfers what it reads to the computer with a driver, with software. And Epson, in my opinion, is superior at doing that, especially when it comes to photos. I have an HP office jet that we use all the time, but I don't use it for photos. 
because it saves everything as JPEG. Even if you tell it to save it as TIFF, it, save, it compresses the file like a JPEG would, and it, then it saves it as a TIFF. And I can see the difference. I don't like that. So Epson is very user. I just like their interface right now. OK? And then that kind of answers that. I was going to ask, what's, why do you say to save as a TIFF and not as a JPEG? Why? Ah, anybody know why I say? Yes, ma'am. Much higher resolution on the TIFF than on the JPEG. And every time you open and close the JPEG, it loses more resolution. OK. You have the religion, but you don't understand it. OK. <laughs> so I want to make sure you're clear, because you said two totally different things I want to correct. Resolution is irrelevant to file format. It's independent. File format is quality. So it is the detail. And compression, you said compression, which is the right word, but compression happens regardless of resolution. Okay, I need more. You could have a 6,000, or I don't know if you really could get that, but we'll just say a 600 pixel per inch image. That's the resolution. Saving it as a JPEG, still going to be the same resolution. But it's detail. We have to get into that in another. In my course, I actually take you through a whole exercise where you actually watch your image degrade as you, as you do it. It really burns it into your mind of why JPEG and TIFF are completely different. But TIFF does no compression. JPEG compresses. And all it's doing is averaging out color. JPEG averages out color to make an image smaller so you can send it through the wires or through the ether, right? So that, that helps, right? But if your camera is only giving you JPEGs, that's fine. But like she said, if you work on it, you got to save it as a TIFF. Otherwise, every time you save that JPEG, you work on it, open, close it, save it, work on it, close it, open it. Save. Every time you do that, it compresses it, recompresses, recompresses, recompresses. So if you're going to work on it, save it as a TIFF. If you're not, it's OK. It's what you get. You have, that's what you have. Don't, some people are like, oh, I made 5,000 scans, and they're all JPEG. Well, look, don't worry about it unless you're going to work on it. Go ahead. Yeah, well, that's it. I'm working. I'm helping our, my local historical society, and somebody scanned in all the pictures as JPEGs. Yeah. And you can't, for example, if my relative is the third guy from the left over, yeah. I can't blow up his face enough to get like a nice little. Yeah, shot and, of and it. see, that's that could be a combination of resolution and file format. You know, because when you save as a JPEG, depending on the quality of the JPEG. It compresses and averages out those colors, and you see gummy details. Yeah, and resolution too. So resolution's got to be right. File format's got to be right. In which society? Mount Prospect Historical. Mount Prospect Historical. OK, yeah. Yeah, give me a call if you need any tips or whatever, you know. Well, we're going to go back here and rescan the things as TIFFs. OK. So we have Good. something where we Good. can extract. Good. And your black and white, save them, scan them as color. Really? Yes, please. A lot more detail. Okay. Go ahead. OK, uh, I think you might have answered my question, but uh, I've got this beautiful 16 by 20 picture. Yes. Do I get a pair of scissors and cut before the pieces so I can scan it? Or, or OK, I that 16 by 20 on? picture does not deserve a scissors. <laughs> um, but I want to scan it. Okay. So what you do is you scan it in pieces. You, you, actually, you actually keep it. Oh, it's working now. OK. Uh, you scan that corner. Move it down, scan the other corner, move it down, scan the and other use corner. That tool to put it all together. And then use that tool to put it all together. Okay. Overlap. Well, we'll Try to it. take the lid off if you can. It's got those little ridges. Well, you got it. Hold it down. You know, you may have to use a phone book. I, this might not be appropriate. It might crack. I don't know. I don't know the condition of the thing. Also, do a copy shot with a digital camera. Well, Consider that. Take yeah. Scan I say do both and see how they look. Yeah. And and say so do do your copy shot of the whole six number twenty, and then do copy shots of different parts, especially the eyes, because when you're out this far doing a copy shot, the detail of the eyes you lose it, you lose quite a bit. So get in there with a close copy, a close shot of the eyes, and then have photo merge. Put the eyes in there. Um, they have scanners that go on, you know, roll across the picture too. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, okay, the scanners that roll across the picture, be careful with those. Uh, they can be a little flip pal as well. They're, they, uh, they, don't, uh, they don't always let you save as a, as a TIFF. I don't think any of them do, actually. Yeah, yeah. Flip pal, you don't have to be steady because it sits there, but uh, uh, they save as a JPEG. So you really want to make sure you save as the highest resolution possible. Because you're but stuck you with a JPEG. Say, so if it is absolute that you don't have a choice, if it's a JPEG, you can convert it to a TIFF after that. Yeah, but it's still going to change. It's still going to, right, you convert it to a TIFF, but again, you, there's still a compromise of, of detail. I have a, if you go to my website, you go to my blog, uh, we have a card, we have, a, I, I talk about it, I have a, I actually do search for FlipPal, and I do a, before and after, I show what, a scan from here and a scan from uh, from uh, FlipPal, and and I show you see it. You may say, "Oh, that quality is okay. That kind of compromise is okay for me. Fine." But you really got to be careful. You got to know what you're dealing with. And sir, in the back, yes. Is there some way of utilizing a 35 millimeter color select through a scanner? Yes. Okay, so if I have a 35 millimeter color side, will will the Epson scanner scan? Yes, uh, they have this. You, you pop this off, and you put a little, and you put a little holder here, and you put the slide in there, and then it, it scans it for you. It does a pretty good job. I'm impressed. I'm impressed. And you know, when you buy these things, buy them new. Don't buy them used. And uh, uh, they have nice instructions. It's really easy, and you experiment with it. Scan big, though, for 35 millimeters. Scan lots of resolution. Pump in all the resolution you can, because they're tiny. All right? Yes, ma'am. So I'm scanning in all my high school um, yearbook pictures. Yes. And I'm, I don't want to do a lot of work on them, but um, occasionally there's a big dark spot in a white area or a big light spot in a dark area. What's yes. the easiest way for me to just get rid of those things? Yeah, so a quick way to get rid of these spots is, is in, open them up in Photoshop and use the clone stamp tool and just blot it out. Scanners that would do that for you, eh, I wouldn't let my scanner do that kind of work. I would do it myself. Yeah. And we had another hand I missed. No? Uh, yes. Uh, I, I would imagine the quality of the picture is very journey how this is going to look. I've got a little small picture and it's Glorious can be, you're not going to be able to do that much with it, will you? That's right. If your picture's blurry, it's blurry. It's blurry. But at least you have it, give it, get it the best quality scan you can. Right? Is that it? Great. Thank you. What makes a good scan? What is a selection? What are layers? What is resolution? What is a JPEG? What is TIFF? What is RGB? How do I crop a picture? What is a zoom tool? What is a clone stamp? What are levels? My name is Eric Basir, and I have produced this unique photo restoration and retouching foundations video course to answer all these questions and more. In my classes and workshops, I have taught hundreds how to preserve and restore their personal photographic collections with Adobe Photoshop and Adobe Photoshop Elements. Now you can have me as your personal instructor in this 10 lesson course. After studying the videos and easy to read workbook, you'll finish with a firm foundation of how to use Adobe Photoshop or any other photo editing program confidently and correctly.